spent the last... Uh, Am I the first person not to turn the microphone on? So I've spent the last two days wearing a backpack and sitting on the stairs, which I thought was highly symbolic because it reminded me of being a student. There's so much interesting stuff going on in life. I was always late, so I was always sitting on the stairs. And we are students. In our, in our highest form, we are perpetual students. But it was also symbolic because I spent quite a large portion of my life being a fire hazard, and uh, I suspect that's the real reason why we're not supposed to sit on the stairs. Um, I don't know what life is all about, but I do know that we all have this deep-rooted need for meaning. And uh, I think whatever you're doing in life, you can, find, you can find a way to make it important by finding a way to be part of something that truly has meaning. Um, I, I love the story of a, of a dad who was, who was asking his kid to do some dish, dishes or something, and the, the kid was giving him some grief, and he said, you know, when Abraham Lincoln was your age, he had to go out into the freezing snow and chop wood and bring it back and make a fire to keep his family alive. To which the kid said, well, Dad, when Abraham Lincoln was your age, he was president. <laughs> life... <laughs> life is fundamentally short, and I think it's shorter than any of us can actually realize. And so, so the, the only thing that I really live by is this idea that one should make no small plans. You should always be focused on something that, is, that you think potentially could be part of something meaningful, something something beautiful. And I've been very lucky to be part of a couple of things. I really loved Nellie Ben's uh, sort of portrayal of the, the Soyuz experience, and, and around that, the whole sort of experience of, of life in, uh, as a cosmonaut or as an astronaut. My own experience was a little grittier. It was a little bit more like this, um, and, and less with the bunny suit. But it was, um, it was an incredible thing to be part of, part of a, a training environment which had actually brought space travel to the world. But that's not the project I want to talk about. I want to talk about another thing, which is Ubuntu. Not the state of being or the state of relationship, although we named it after that. This is a, this is a software project. And at, at heart, it's all about a phenomenon called open source. And open source is like Wikipedia for software. It's about bringing together the world's experts, the world's most passionate experts, people who um, are really intrigued by how things work and also um, anxious to bring some of that expertise to the rest of the world. And these thousands of people all around the world collaborate to make extraordinary tools. Some of those may be familiar to you, like, uh, like Chrome or Android or Firefox. But in fact, there's this, there's this vast portfolio of tools that today are really the engine of innovation in software. You know, Google runs on open source, Yahoo, Facebook. They all are powered by open source. They're all built by people who knew how to take open source tools and work magic with them. There was a great expression earlier today saying that, saying that uh, you can't experiment with expensive things. And that's absolutely true. You know, we think that innovation comes from large corporations because they have money. Innovation comes from large corporations because they're so large that they don't notice when somebody's goofing off doing very little, very cheaply. And that's where innovation comes from. Um, so open source is this hot bed of innovation because it's free. And so people all over the world take things that were written by one person to do one thing, and they turn it into something completely different. It's the world's best kept technology secret. And what Ubuntu is all about is about transforming that into something that, in fact, is the way everybody uses and does software. I built pretty much everything I've done in technology with open source, and I had this, this desire to kind of bring it to, to a wider audience. And that was the genesis of Ubuntu. Uh, and we didn't change much, really. All we said was a couple of things. First, we said we'd create this code of conduct. We wanted to build a community. It wasn't just going to be about a company that we'd build, although we wanted to build a company. We're going to build a community of thousands of people. And the only thing that glues them together is this code of conduct, which was something that was new, in, like an, an ethical code or a, a, a moral code, a communication code, in amongst all of these hackers and geeks. And the other thing we said was we would deliver the software every six months on a cadence. We would take our ego out of it and we would just deliver the very best of what the open source world could do every six months. So we're in this incredible situation that we can deliver software. I can tell you, you know, for the next four years, the delivery dates of the software and which versions are going to be enterprise versions, because that's just how we do it. And we can only do that because it's open source. The, the, the critical thing, though, is that Ubuntu is a partnership. It's a partnership between me and my colleagues in a company and thousands of people. 
um, who participate. And they do all sorts of incredible things. They, they're advocates and, and champions and documenters and translators. They, they organize uh, adoption fests and store fests. They, 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 they're deeply passionate. Um, they, they do all of these things. They look like this. Um, you know, some of them are guys who've been around working with computers since computers would have filled this room. Um, they look like this. This is UCT on Wednesday night. It was the blue train or this. And uh, that's, that's me in the Darth Vader mask. <clears throat> they look like this. They're passionate about what they do. Scarily, sometimes they look like this. But what they don't look like, typically, is that. Until we showed up, until we started to get passionate about design, design was virtually not existent in, non-existent in the open source world. And <clears throat> as a result, we produced a series of releases of Ubuntu every six months, um, all of which looked a little bit like this. And when we talked to people about it, they said it was reliable, it was, it was safe, it was um, uh, useful. It was easy, generally, except sometimes it was a little bit awkward. But often they said it was ugly. And it became clear to me that if we wanted to, if we wanted to, to really achieve the dream of bringing this free software to, to a much wider audience, we'd have to transform things. We'd have to inject, we'd have to inject design, but not just inject design as something on the side. We'd have to actually make it part of the fabric of the way the open source community does their stuff. Um, so it was going to be about design, but it was also going to be about leadership. And this presented me with a real challenge because leadership in the open source community is, is really about herding cats. There are literally thousands of projects and teams and they all have their own values and they disagree with each other furiously. It's going to be really hard to do. So I knew it couldn't be something that, that uh, we bolted on on the side. It was going to be something that, that, that I wanted to shoulder personally to try and champion this idea. So at the time I was the, the sort of CEO and founder of the company that was at the heart of, of Ubuntu. And I used to wear suits quite a lot. And I knew I was going to have to change that. I was going to have to do something a little more radical. I was going to have to become a designer. And I didn't know anything about design. So I went out and found this amazing person. Her, her name is Maich. She comes from a, a very um, fragmented part of the world. And so she's, she's an amazingly whole person. And her parents arranged to give her the, initi the initials IM. So she's taken that message uh, quite to heart. Uh, I hired her because she said she wanted to bring a little bit more of this to the world. We, we decided to do one thing really differently with design. Um, everything about open source and Ubuntu is about real-time global collaboration. But for design, we just didn't think we could do that. Right? We, we wanted to build a team that was going to be really tight, really cohesive. And initially, at least, we didn't think we had the tools for real-time interpersonal collaboration. So then we ran into, as we started to build this capacity, we ran into a series of challenges, and that's really one of what, what, what I want to talk about. First, starting with, with this guy, Marcus Haslam, we wanted to build a visual language uh, that we could bring to all of the materials and all the software and, and all, all of our stuff. And immediately we ran into this challenge. Typically, when you do this kind of exercise, right, you're in control, and you have one message, and it's about relentless focus on a particular set of rules, set of constraints, set of guidelines. And we just couldn't do that. We, had this, we have this incredible community. Um, for, their, for, 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 for them, Ubuntu is their project. And the brand is their voice. The visual language is their expressiveness. So we didn't want to lose all of this. And <clears throat> we had to figure out how to create a framework which would give a voice to people who didn't represent the company as well as a voice to people who do. And in fact, the more we looked at it, the more we started to realize that there was all this overlap in between as well. So we had this challenge. People said branding must be exclusive. We said, that's not the case. And we tried to do this designing for duality thing. We recognized that essentially everything we do has two faces. It has a, a, a potentially an enterprise or a corporate face, which is the professional side. But it also has this amazing, passionate, amateur, in the best sense of the world, word, for the love of it, voice. And so we, we had to conceive of these two brands, these two visual languages that had to work really well together. And, and this, was a, this was an exercise that was, that was foreign to most of the people we try to work with uh, on, on the program. So we had to develop a lot of this. I loved what, uh, what uh, David from Coca-Cola had to say about designing systems. But it felt like we were essentially designing two systems at once, 
one for our community and one for the company, <clears throat> but more often than not, they had to be able to work together. Uh, when we got into it, we realized that it wasn't as simple as just the company and the community. In fact, we had multiple audiences. We had enterprise audiences and consumer audiences, and we had material that was really focused on developers and material that was really focused on end users. And so we ended up with this um, sort of three-dimensional um, uh, uh, system of basically creating uh, verbs and nouns, visual verbs and nouns, um, that you could use to express subliminally where you are, who you're speaking for, who you're speaking to, and what the point of your communication is. We made this, this uh, language using, using common themes in, 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 in diverse fashions. And so this was, this was really interesting. We had to design a system, but it wasn't just one system, David. It was two systems, a voice for us and a voice for our community. And they had to rhyme. They had to be coherent. It's amazing. I mean, f f for me today, I see, uh, I see materials getting produced um, by, by people who don't work for us that express that like this. So that took us, uh, that took us a, a, a year or so to, to understand and then to, to express. And the, uh, the, the, the payoff essentially for us now is that th all over the world there are people who use these systems uh, and write materials, create materials, sometimes that are essentially expressing a view for, for the company and sometimes are expressing entirely the view for a community. And, and being academic uh, uh, OCD types, they really took this language to heart. So the next big challenge we had to, to face was, was one of typography. Um, type is this extraordinary art. I'm looking forward to Aded's presentation uh, uh, next up. So, so uh, for me, this was a, was, a new, was, a, was a new area. But it was absolutely clear that we had to try and achieve something, something extraordinary. We wanted to produce a font that would be instantly freely available um, all over the world. It had to be, otherwise we couldn't include it in Ubuntu. Not only that, but it had to be a font that people were allowed to change, uh, which, is, which is sort of antithetical to the, to the classic control-oriented approach that typographers favor. And it needed to be something that, uh, that, that, that expressed our values and personality, but it also needed to be something that worked really well in an interface. In an interface, you, uh, you, you're looking at it all day, every day. You're making critical split-second de split decisions based on what you read. Your willingness to read at all um, is, is uh, to a certain extent determined by the type. So this was a really interesting challenge. I didn't, I didn't think at first that we would be able to produce one font that we used in all of our communications, our brand, but also in, uh, in the interface. Um, Marcus introduced us to this guy, Bruno Marg, from a firm called Dalton Marg. And uh, it's a delightful guy, um, a Swiss living in London. And uh, we gave him some, some good news, which is that we wanted to commission a font across uh, Latin, Hebrew, Arabic, uh, Russian, Cyrillic, uh, in six different weights, in condensed and in mono. Uh, all of this is sounding really good to a, to a type design agency. And then we said, but uh, we want to give it away. And we, we, we don't just want to give it away uh, as, a, as a pristine jewel. We want to give away the raw materials. We want to publish it under an open font license. And you're going to have to collaborate. And you're going to have to collaborate with this guy. Um, not specifically, but in principle. But uh, Dalton Mark took it on. And uh, they, they've sort of since said that it's been you know, possibly the most complex and interesting project that they've had to work on. They're still involved. Um, uh, essentially, what they did is they would provide a, 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 a typographic leadership role. They're obviously in a good position to do Latin. Um, but then as we extend out to the other language groups, what we do is we engage with the community um, who provide us with the most extraordinary feedback. And it's kind of incredible when you work in this way because you'll get some feedback that is unbelievably detailed. You know, uh, People saying that the, 
um, Romanian Unicode glyph is actually incorrectly expressed in the standard because it needs to be this way because in Windows it breaks when you do that in a DOS application. And uh, we get lots of that feedback. And then also artistic creative feedback as well. Um, I think this has been for, for, for Dalton Mark, they describe it as a, as, as, as a rich and rewarding experience. I've, I've, seen, Dal, uh, I've seen Bruno um, talk about this. One of the key things though, I think if you're going to produce something for the world, which is our ambition, you have to do it with the benefit of participation from people who understand the local tradition, the local history. Uh, we're far from done. We're going to have to do Chinese. That's probably the next major step. Um, but we have the, 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 the core of it in the interface today. The last version of Ubuntu shipped with it. Um, and being an open source font, it's, it's, it's done all sorts of amazing things. It was the first operating system to ship with support for a whole bunch of new currency symbols. Um, being a live thing with literally hundreds of people working on it, 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 it can be dynamic and uh, um, uh, diverse at the same time, while still keeping, keeping true to its heritage. Um, we published it uh, through Google. Google have started this web font directory. Google essentially want to make it possible for people to use all of these open fonts. Uh, and, uh, and just in the space of sort of two months, we bumped up to number five in terms of the way Google tracks the usage of font on the web. Because being, being an interface-oriented font, obviously, in lots of languages, it's, uh, it's really useful for people who are, who are sort of building websites. And it's so trivial now. It's just li literally two lines of CSS. And you can pull the font into your website from Google uh, and, uh, and, and, and just use it instantly free of charge. Um, and that, for me, really captured what, what was both the spirit of Ubuntu, the spirit of open source, and, and the opportunity to work with great designers. Um, and then we came to our, I think, what remains our greatest challenge, right? And that was the core usability, user experience of the software itself. And our vision, ultimately, is to, is to have a set of experiences which, are, which, which you can move smoothly from one to the next. There's a phone that Motorola just um, uh, launched, which is a, a touch phone, uh, but you can dock it. You can dock it into sort of a, what looks like a laptop, but it's a laptop without a computer in it. When you dock the phone, the phone becomes a computer and suddenly you get a desktop. It just so happens that that desktop is Ubuntu. Um, and I think that's a vision of the future. I think people are going to carry their computing around with them, which means we need to get to the point where one device, one interface, can es essentially cover, um, uh, cover a, a variety of form factors. Now, each of those form factors, of course, has its own truth, has its own inherent nature. And if you, if you, if you, veer, if you don't respect that, then, then you're not going to produce something great for that. Um, uh, but there needs to be a coherency, cohesiveness, around all of these. I think this is the greatest opportunity in, in handheld or desktop computing today because whoever gets this right is really going to define what people use for the next 10 or 20 years. So we had a problem. We were starting with something which is absolutely functional, uh, super reliable, doesn't get viruses. It's being used by literally tens of millions of people, um, but it had very little um, had, had, had had the benefit of very little sort of real design expertise. We're also a small team, so we had to sort of figure out where we could make changes at any given time, and we had to plan those changes. We make this, these releases every six months, so one of our guys describes this as not just art, but performance art. You know, we may have a two-year vision, a grand vision of where we want to get to, but every six months, the curtain will open, and we don't want to be caught naked on the stage. So every six months, we have to deliver a, a, a useful piece towards that, that, that grand vision. And, and, and I'll give you a taste of some of the things that we've done. We've got a very long way to go, but uh, it's, it's amazing how it's speeding up as this meme flows. So this is kind of roughly where we started. And, and one of the first things we wanted to do is we wanted to focus on, on um, we, we, we did a lot of research on how people were using computers. And they said that they found them, kind of, they found them a lot of work. They found them uh, uh, busy. Uh, cluttered. They found it hard to focus, but at the same time, they wanted to be uh, uh, plugged in everywhere. Um, you know, this is a this is a real time sort of era. Uh, and we became fascinated with this idea of this tension between focus and awareness. On the one hand, you want to be concentrating on something. It's appalling to feel like you get to the end of the day and and it just disappeared, right? You want at any given time to be able to completely immerse yourself in something. At the same time, you want to be aware of what's going on around you. And Zen Buddhists have this term, ayatana, 
um, which is, as I understand it, the, the, your awareness of your environment while you're meditating on a particular thing. And obviously, you don't want the awareness to intrude, to break your focus, but you, you don't want to lose track of what's, what's going on around you. And so we, we embrace this idea of ayatana and just and try to you know, bang on the whole interface from that perspective. So starting with the, the sort of peripheral awareness piece, um, that toolbar gives you a lot of status information. We looked at how people were um, using that in Ubuntu and they were just cramming all sorts of stuff in there. This had been designed by engineers and they wanted you to be able to do anything and everything, so people were. Um, and that meant that the thing was, was, uh, was amazingly functional but essentially unpredictable and, and unusable. You had no idea what would happen if you clicked or right clicked or hovered or did anything over any of those things or how they would behave. There were no commonalities, no patterns. So we said fine, we would strip this down to its, to its, uh, to its base, uh, base elements. Um, the, 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 the first thing we wanted to do was to, to make sure that any information that was being communicated there was immediately apparent. So we said, okay, everything will go to, to monochrome, except for some specific uses of color which have very specific meanings. We took some inspiration from the research that's been done in, in how cockpits are designed. We had a big fight about whether, you know, taking, taking, um, uh, taking input from, you know, what works for very sophisticated environments like fighter pilots and, and commercial jets was appropriate for something that we wanted to be you know, easy to use in every day. Eventually, you know, this idea won that we wanted to, 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 to simplify that interface. So essentially you could, at a glance, tell that everything was copacetic, everything was hunky-dory, unless there was something in particular that was different. Uh, so we called this a symbolic, a shift to a symbolic indicator set. Uh, that muted icon over there, the, the red only shows if there's sound playing while it's muted. So in general, if you, if you don't need to be aware of something, we take it out of your awareness. We, we want to preserve your focus. If there's some sort of conflict or tension or problem, then we make, uh, we make you aware of that. So this is saying essentially you need to, you need to do a restart, uh, you're muted and the sound is playing, and someone has sent a message to you. Um, the other problem we, we notice is that <clears throat> every application wants to, have, wants to claim that space. And those of you who are familiar with other operating systems will know that you get this, you install an application and suddenly it wants to take space on your toolbar. And, uh, and that results in a lot of clutter. It starts to break the clarity of the messaging there. So we came up with this idea that, that essentially we would try to organize categories of indicators and we would encourage applications to embed themselves in that and only surface the pieces of state that were relevant. So for example, here in the sound indicator, we designed the ability for applications, music playing applications, to embed themselves in there, and so you can always get to control your sound through there. You don't have to go to the application, um, but you also don't end up with multiple sound uh, or media playing things in the panel. Um, people today use multiple, have multiple pieces of software. They play, play music. They may have iTunes. They may have Spotify. They may be on Last FM. And we wanted to be able to consolidate and distill that down to its essence. So we built it. We built it for the core music player in Ubuntu, and then this amazing open source process happened, and, and, and the Clementine guys did it, and then the Spotify guys did it, and so suddenly, you know, it just, it just worked. We wanted to do the same thing for messaging. So essentially, there's one core concept, and that is that, you know, someone's trying to reach you, and it's someone that, 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 that you consider important, or it's unusual, so, so symbolically, you see that, and then as you dive into that experience, you can see who, where, what, and how. So the idea is you can come back to your computer, and you don't have tons of things that have stacked up and popped up on your window. You just have this one clear, clean statement that something's going on. Another, another part of this whole awareness thing is, is interruptions, notifications, events. Um, and uh, um, some of you may be familiar with this, or my favorite one, this. Um, these are really pretty bad in Windows XP. Astonishingly, they managed to get worse because um, they're all complex, why not just give them, a, why not give them a, a whole set of options and toolbars as well? We wanted to go the opposite way. Uh, we wanted to take all the work out of these things. Um, and the work in these things comes from all sorts of subtle things. For example, the fact that, the fact that, the, that they have that dismiss button uh, means that you can actually go and click on it. It means that sometimes you want to go and click on it. It means that every time the damn thing shows up, you feel like work just arrived. Uh, the settings, you know, don't make that any better. So we said we'll go the opposite way. We'll get rid of all of the control that you have. Um, 
we will make some hard assumptions about what's important and what's not important. Uh, and we'll, in fact, take away your ability to do any work on this at all. So these, what we call ephemeral notifications, are semi-transparent. And if you mouse over them, we actually blur them, and you can click straight through them and work straight through them as if they weren't there. So it takes, it takes all of the work out of this blob that could show up on your, on, your, on your desktop because there is no work to do. And if you need to work through it, you know, it's just something that can disappear off into, uh, into the background. This was hugely controversial in the, in the community when we did it, but nobody wants to go back now. We were getting a lot of commissions from companies like, uh, like Dell to put Ubuntu on small computers that they were shipping into, the, into emerging markets. And, and so we had these computers all around. We realized that um, uh, the screens are really small and space is really precious. And from a design point of view, this was, this was wonderful. This gave us a real sort of challenge, a real hard constraint on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, this is a place where we could play. Uh, these, these computers were, um, uh, were essentially considered secondary computers because they were so small. Uh, and so we could be more radical. We could, we could break some rules. We got really fascinated with the use of space on the screen. Um, Chrome is all of the stuff around the stuff that you need, the stuff that you care about, right? So there's, there's the good stuff, which is what you care about, what you're focused on, and then there's the bad stuff, which is, belongs to Mr. Ballmer, and 99% of it is not useful for you, but it's stealing your space, which is incredibly precious. So. We looked at Ubuntu and we had exactly this problem, right? On small screens, uh, for somebody who's just interested in anime, there's a whole lot of stuff on the screen which isn't important. And so we, we launched this kind of relentless program to see what we could do about going Chromeless, how we could really surface content, how we could make uh, content be king in the interface. Um, so for example, that whole title bar is, is telling you something. The whole top panel is, has got a bunch of stuff that you can't use. So we figured initially we did some experimentation with how we could combine those together for, for small screens. And this was a version that we shipped for a while um, uh, on these small, small devices. Uh, and people really liked that, this idea that we were, we were giving them that extra about 6 7% of the screen. And then increasingly, we, we, we started to wonder about menus. You know, they, they um, Again, when you're not using a menu, it's not really telling you anything. It's not giving you any state. Uh, and if you need it, there are other ways to get to that. And many applications are getting designed now without menus. So we said, okay, well, how, how radical can we get? And so we, we, we moved to a world where essentially the, the, the menu is hidden and only shows up. Um, only shows up when you need it. And uh, again, this is, this is a change that will ship in uh, the next version, it's immediately controversial. And yet when we test it, uh, we introduce the change quietly without telling people, and they don't seem to notice. You know, they just go up and the menu's there when they need it, and, and they may be a bit confused about it, but it doesn't actually slow them down at all. And yet we've saved um, a bunch more screen real estate. Um, I think that a lot of these old conventional um, uh, interface techniques are gonna get are going to get reinvented, are going to get um, uh, uh, radically changed as interface, as we experience all these other kinds of devices. So essentially, just saying the menu was far less important than anything else on the screen was, was one way of just precipitating that and, and, and challenging people to come up with better ways to expose uh, what happens with menus. So here's, here, I mean, geeks, we use terminals all the time. You know, we're in the, in the console. And this focus on, 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 on the, the focus and Ayatana, you know, this is where we'd got to. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to concentrate on a terminal, as, as geeks want to do, there's virtually no Chrome now. There's some, there's some status information that's useful, and the rest of the screen is essentially your application, except for this bit of legacy over here. So we were trying to figure out what we could do about that, and we took inspiration from what people are doing in, in the mobile world. And I would ask that nobody tweet or photograph or blog this or talk about it in, in your sleep because we'll, we'll, uh, we'll introduce this in the next couple of weeks and I, I wouldn't want to, to spoil the supply, surprise. And we still have some work to do on it. Um, so we're moving to, to, to a world where, where these 
pieces of Chrome are essentially just there when you need them. So we'll, we'll, we'll introduce them as overlays. The problem is, in these form factors, we don't have touch interfaces. So um, uh, we actually have to figure out how to, how to um, let people interact with these scroll bars. But again, the principle is that we're working towards is that um, whatever you need is there, but only when you, when you actually want it. So this is roughly what it will look like um, in April. So these pieces of Chrome show up only when you need them. They position themselves so that they're just underneath your mouse. Um, there's some signaling that tells you, you know, when that's important. They try and stay out of the content area. Um, we don't know if this is going to work. We're testing it right now. Um, the initial feedback is very positive, but they're corner cases, literally corner cases when you, you've really got these things right down in the corner. I think all of these devices are going to get, are going to become touch enabled. So having this kind of have, having this kind of approach will feel like a natural transition to uh, to, to touch enabled devices um, in the future. Another thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to take inspiration from devices. Um, you know, people spend a lot of time in front of PlayStations and, 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 and mobile devices today. And the desktop, by comparison, feels kind of legacy, feels kind of old. You know, things happen inside Windows and you've got to do a lot of work with the Windows. But a lot of things that happen inside Windows are essentially taking over the system. So we said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll introduce a PlayStation-like feel to some of those experiences. Um, we introduced this launcher, which, is, which, which has some specific behaviors um, in it so that, so that it's, it, it's touch-friendly, um, has these kind of accordion-type behaviors. Um, and, and, we, and we introduced some sort of full-screen behaviors, particularly for things that we think uh, are going to change in, in the interface. So, for example, finding files. Uh, it's amazing when you watch people use computers. Uh, uh, all of us, you know, we'll, we'll get something from, something gets emailed to us and we'll save it somewhere and then we'll want to send it to a friend and we'll try and open it and we have no idea where we put it. And uh, I used to read that kind of report and think, oh, ha, you know, users. Uh, and then I find myself doing it. And the truth is we're just crap with files and folders, so they've got to go. And uh, this is a start to a better kind of interface, essentially just saying, if you're looking for something, we can, we, 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 we're going to anticipate what you're looking for and very quickly help you converge on where you're going. So we introduced this kind of full screen experience. Um, interestingly, about six months after we did this, Apple introduced their App Store with a very similar presentation, a full screen kind of experience showing, showing you these are all the apps in your device. So, so hopefully we can stay just one small step ahead even while we catch up on all of the cruft we have in the background. So this gets challenging. We ship that interface actually on for, for smaller screens. On large screens, we have this problem that that, that going full screen is really uh, can be can be heavy on a 30-inch monitor. So again, playing with variations on that theme, keeping the device-like feel, but but moving to something just a little more um, a, a little more lightweight for for large machines. And a key idea for us is that search should be your primary interface for everything. You know, you should never be hunting for something. Just say what you want. Um, the, the IBM uh, Watson Jeopardy gig where they had a computer essentially that could understand questions and respond with general knowledge answers uh, better than experts in that game uh, is sort of a harbinger of the future. In 20 years time your phone will do that. So, uh, and maybe sooner because your phone just has to be the conduit, right? It doesn't actually have to have all of the compute. Um, so search is one step towards really a spoken interface. And so this is a big theme for us. We're trying to introduce search everywhere so that you, you, you can very quickly switch or jump or, or, or find whatever it is that you're looking for. So in conclusion, a couple of things. First, it's a big invitation. You know, there's this enormous community of, of crazy, smart, difficult, sometimes passionate people, and they desperately need design love. Uh, as a hobby, as an interest, if you have any kind of software that you're interested in, there's an open source version of it. Go and find it, introduce yourselves. These guys do amazing thing, things over mailing lists in, this, in, the, in their spare time. And the difference that you can make just by saying, well, let's look at this a little bit differently. Let's challenge, let's challenge the development teams. 
is extraordinary. But the thing that I am most excited about so far is not that we've been able to do this stuff in Ubuntu, but that I see teams outside of Ubuntu starting to embrace this and wanting to work with designers. Um, sometimes they don't get it. Sometimes, you know, the attitude is, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years, who are you to come and um, tell us what to do? But, but in many cases, they are fascinated at the challenges that designers can pose to them. You know, you don't know about the constraints and they don't know about the constraints. When you put those pieces together, your mutual constraints, you can make really interesting things. So if you're interested, go and find a community, put your foot in, see if, uh, see if something wonderful happens. So I've now been working with designers for, for two years and as you can see from this sartorial disaster, I know nothing, right? I, I have no sense of taste, but I, you know, maybe it's starting to rub off and I certainly have observations. Um, and I see some interesting patterns. The one thing I would say is that I really believe that design is important. I wouldn't have switched away from running the company and so on to, 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 to be the figurehead champion of design at Canonical if I didn't believe that it wasn't critical to not just our business, but to our community and to the mission. Um, so don't put yourselves down. I sometimes see designers saying, oh, you know, this, my stuff's not important, and I don't know, it's not worth anything, and blah, blah, blah. That's not true. Um, but I also see pathology on the other side, where, where I see designers who are, you know, brilliant in one way or another, but are so precious about those ideas that they refuse to let them be tested or challenged. Uh, that, that video that we saw of, of the designer, you know, reacting to, to customer requests was, was a bit sad, because histrionics never actually shipped a product, never actually put things in people's hands. So I, I sometimes meet designers who are convinced that they have all the answers but refuse to let them be tested. And to me, the really wonderful opportunity is to get these things together and actually get stuff out there that's a little bit better. Um, uh, if, if you want to do that, you're gonna have to convince people who have a very different perspective. And, and, and while as much as it's interesting for us to try, as much as I will try and convince them to walk in your shoes, it's sometimes interesting to walk in other people's shoes as well. And lastly, again, I don't know what the meaning of life is, but I've never seen a designer that could match anything quite as beautiful as this. So let's take care of it. Anyway, thank you very much.